Speaking about education, I mean, I, I'm looking at some figures here, and I just kind of wonder, how was this done? I see that there's this massive enrollment at, at primary school level, about 1 million in 2005, is now close to 1.5 million in 2011. That's about 50% increase. And secondary schools as well, it rose from 142,729 yeah. in 2005 mm -hmm. to 280,973 in 2001. And this was why you were in government. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there's free education, but there are some other states who have it, but don't have this kind of figure. What else did you do to ensure that this came to, to be? You know, education is the number one tool of breaking the cycle of poverty. When I came into office in 2007, I left no one in doubt that my number one priority is education and education and education. Without education, no nation can hope to forget progress. No nation can hope to move, you know, to the level of development and success that it needs to. That is why we unbundled the problems around in education, or we made sure that we made education free at all levels. Since I became governor, education is absolutely free in primary schools and secondary schools. And government pays for examination fees for WAIC, NACO, NAPTEC, SSCE for all students in public schools in Katsina State since I became governor in 2007. And by the special grace of God, we felt there is a challenged group, the girls. Young girls in northern Nigeria oftentimes have little or no opportunity to go to school. And even if they do, you know, the question of poverty still remains an issue with the parents. So we came up with a strategy of setting up a special department called the Girl Child Education and Development Department. That's a department or a department. A department or so And I appointed a special advisor who was doing a pretty good job. And uh, we went out of the concept of establishing one girl child primary school for a local girl, exclusively for girls. And uh, that girl child primary school in each of the 34 local governments attracted you know, young girls who are admitted in these schools and who are doing pretty well. And then we introduced the conditional cash transfer grants. We are working with other donor agencies like UNICEF, like you said, and others. And these conditional cash transfer grants are meant to assist mothers and the kids to stay in school. So stipends are given to the mothers every time. And the same stipends are given to the girls to stay in school. You call it conditional? Conditional cash transfer grants. Why is it conditional? What are the conditions? Because they have to remain in school uh, for the parents to continue receiving these stipends from the government okay. and from donor agencies. And of course, the spiraling uh, number of children that are going to school in Katsina is not only as a result of the free education, but additional facilities. We built over 200 new secondary schools in Katsina. We expanded our primary school to student building. Take a trip there, channels, go and see for yourselves. You know, and in addition, we hired more teachers. We bought more teaching aids and equipment. And we introduced bus services in some of the local government headquarters to ferry our students at Tanera per drop in, in Katina, in Daura, in Funtua, in Malamfaji, in Dusab. And on top of that, we made sure we improve the salary of our teachers. Because you know, they say you can afford to have a school without a classroom. Mm -mm. But you cannot have, afford to have a school without a teacher. So we now decided to pay attention to the welfare of our teachers. And we were one of the first tests to implement the TSS service scheme on our primary and secondary school teachers in Nigeria. And in addition to that, we increased the salary of the workers of tertiary institution our teachers and tertiary institutions, the salaries were in, 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 increased, I think about twice. At the end of my first tenure, I don't know if there's any other state who did it, but I know that it's a fact, and my teachers in Katsina State know it's a fact, that we give them one month salary bonus at the end of our first tenure to encourage teachers to continue to do what they do. You made education your number one priority when you came into government. You've done this for over six years now. Uh, in seven. Seven. So yes. there you go. But this negates well, what we see, uh, the insurgency now. The girls who have been kid kidnapped, the news out there is they don't want them to go to school. And this completely negates what you've been doing and maybe what some others are doing up there. Tell us about your thoughts on that one. You know, job creation first is the critical tool to break 
insurgency. We have to create jobs. And uh, my understanding of the insurgency that we're experiencing in Nigeria today stems from the fact that Nigeria has critical challenges that we must face headlong. Illiteracy, ignorance, unemployment, drug addiction, transnational crimes, and indeed, the electoral process in Nigeria, which brings about sometimes, oftentimes, perceived injustice. These components have to be collectively addressed by all strata of leadership in Nigeria. It is a sad story that a beautiful country like Nigeria, with tremendous human and material resources, supposedly it should be the most dynamic business destination of the world today. Look at how our economy is moving. The largest economy in Africa today, with a growth rate about 7%. And yet, we are faced with these challenges. Insurgency, you know, it's recurrent on the African continent. Armed conflicts are prevalent on the continent, not just in Nigeria, but elsewhere in Africa and even in West Africa. But here, in Nigeria, what leaders, all of us, must do and address the concern of Nigerians is to bring this nation together, is to work as members of our family. In Katsina, when I became governor, a group of people came to visit me. And you know what they call themselves? Non-indigenous. And this is what Nigerians call themselves in their own land when they don't live where they're born. <laughs> and I credit them. I said, if you want to come and see me, don't ever address yourselves of non-indigenous in Kassan State. You are Nigerians. The least you can do, or the best you can do, or the worst you can do, is to say you are indigenous Nigerians residing in Kassan. There's no reason why a Nigerian living in any corner of this country should feel that he is not living in his own home or his own country. That nationalistic feeling, that collective feeling, should be there with all of us. In Katsina today, there's, there are people who are from all parts of Nigeria carrying out their trade and businesses effectively and successfully. Just like there are Katsina indigenous in all parts of Nigeria do the same. So Nigerians must come together. We must put our acts together. We must recognize what God has done to all of us by bringing us together. People should not think all the time about turning into enclaves, small cocoons. It doesn't help. It doesn't make you grow. The greatest nations of the world come because of mixture and variety. So my attitude is that the insurgency that we are seeing today, we have to tackle headlong. All leaders of goodwill, leaders, religious leaders, traditional institutions, of course the clergy, and political leaders, we must all put our heads together. Look at the animal support Nigeria is getting from the international community. Nations after nations are coming to our aid on the issue of insurgency, Boko Haram, and kidnapping of the Chibo girls. And why is it happening? Because the world is a common platform now. It's a common stage. No responsible government in the whole world will sit and watch such thing like the kidnapping of children girls happening. Every parent will feel great. I feel great personally. I feel deeply disturbed. And the reason being that it's inhuman to cut away young girls at that age from their schools, struggling to acquire education, struggling to write their exams. What explanation can you have? So you can see the effect of this kind of wicked act. The entire world is coming together now for Nigeria. But Nigerians too must rise to the occasion and do what is right. We must cleanse our institutions. It's not about individuals. Our institutions must be working and they must work effectively and we must work hard 
to ensure that this kind of things don't continue in Nigeria. We have had crisis before in this country. We had challenges on security. Abuleri, Omuleri was a crisis between two warring factions. Ife, Madakeke was a crisis between two warring factions. Maitasini riots, Bulunkutu crisis. Even the Niger Delta issues. These things have happened in Nigeria before. Kidnappings, Katsu wrestling in northern Nigeria, armed banditry, and insurgency. But what is critical is our institutions must be made to work. And they must be made to work responsibly in order for us to bring this to a dismal stop. We can do it. It has been done before. Crisis has happened in Nigeria. They have been brought to a standstill. But we should not allow its escalation. And I'm glad that we're getting support from around the world and sympathy for these young girls and their parents.